So let me start sharing my screen. Okay, as probably some of you already know, uh, today I'm going to talk about the endodontic essentials. Uh, what I meant actually by endodontic essentials is that uh, something that we need to understand uh, in this uh, recent era of endodontic treatment. And I also would like to thank you to VDW for this opportunity. Well, I think we will have uh, three hours uh, today, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Howie. So you're going to sit uh, to your chair tightly for the next three hours and hope you can enjoy that something uh, I would like to share and there is something valuable that you can take. So if you are talking about endodontic, uh, there are six topics that actually I want to discuss with you today. Uh, first thing first is that we need to understand actually what is what is endodontic treatment is it? Uh, and secondly, how we can gain our excess cavity and then how then we can ship our root canal systems, how then we can clean and disinfect. And finally, we, we need to seal uh, our root canal systems. And I'm going to discuss just a little bit about managing open apex because uh, some of you uh, might have this case in your daily practice. And recently there are quite many questions that came to me about this uh, kind of cases. So if you are talking about endodontic, I think I would like to understand what is actually the definitions of endodontic. If you see the endodontic, endodontics actually is the branch in dentistry that is concerning about the morphology, physiology, and also the pathology of the human dental pulp and very apical tissue. And it has two objectives. Why it is so important that I under, underline the two objectives things? Because endodontic will always have treatment objective and will always have final objective. Why it is important? Because uh, back in my uh, university at the time, when I was an uh, undergrad student, I always thinking that in order to save tooth, we need to do some endodontic treatment. Well, actually, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not wrong. It's right. But uh, I just want to emphasize is that the treatment of the uh, objective treatment of endodontic is not just saving the natural tooth. It saving natural tooth is the final objective of endodontic treatment. But the objective of endodontic treatment, how we can completely clean all the pulp chamber, how we can shape, and then how we can disinfect, and how we can fill all the canals nicely. Because if we don't uh, fulfill the objectives of the endodontic treatment, then we will not be able to fulfill the final objective of endodontic treatment. If we are thinking that uh, the objectives of endodontic treatment is directly to save natural tooth, then we might forget how we how important we need to put our time in cleaning, in finding those canal, in shaping those canal and fill. So uh, what we have to understand that the treatment objective is how we can uh, completely clean all the systems. Like you can see in these pictures, this case. How if we if we have this kind of case? The, uh, the objective of endodontic treatment was not fulfilled here. So how can we can save this natural tooth for a long period of time? Because suddenly now there is a lesions and there is a symptoms uh, for the patients. So what we need to do is that we need to correct it. We need to fulfill the endodontic treatment objective itself. We need to find the canals, we need to disinfect, we need to seal, and we need to furthermore restore it with good restorative uh, treatment and we will fulfill the final objective of endodontic treatment. So, for example, this case, this is a fracture case, uh, so typical, and how we need to uh, save this tooth, of course, first things first, that we need to do some endodontic treatment in order to remove all the infected material that can be caused a problems in the next future. But it's not just that, we need to also compete with restorations and we can have, let's say, 10 years uh, uh, follow-up, which is, the tooth is still function there. It's, it, it can be function normally. There is no symptoms whatsoever. So the final objective of endodontic treatment to save natural tooth has been uh, completed. So this is important because if we don't understand uh, what actually uh, endodontic treatment and that it has two objectives, then we might uh, uh, taken uh, uh, wrongly about the understanding of endodontic treatment. And why we need endodontic treatment then? You know, usually if patients came to my clinic and they have pain, in my opinion, there are only two pain that we, uh, that can came in my in my in our office. First thing, if the patients have a pulpitis or they have a periodontitis. So, what is the definitions and what are actually the the, this, uh, the 
the same things from these two conditions. We know that pulpiris is in the inflammations of the dental pulp tissue because of there is bacteria exposures in the pulp area. And if we're dealing with the periodontitis, it means there is some inflammations of the peritoneum caused by bacteria. So both conditions, either is it a pulpiris or it is a periodontitis, both are caused by bacteria. So why we need endodontic treatment? It's simple, because we need to remove bacteria. Because bacteria is the only problems of our endodontic uh, failure of our endodontic problems. And we need to understand that the bacteria that live in our oral cavity, usually they are preferred to exist in the biofilm states. And in these states, they are easy to evade our immune systems. And they can evade to our immune systems because uh, we have some carious lesions. We have some uh, leakage from our restorations or sometimes crack or trauma. So, with there is a place for them to go inside our systems, then they are go inside and then definitely when they are inside, they, they are become mature and the community become complex and they need more protein to survive. And at that time, they will seek some uh, dentinal tubules. They need to seek some fluid and also from the dental pulp. And if, we are, if they already exceed a very large number, then the pulp will be overwhelmed, then it became necrotic. So once the necrotic uh, pulp states has been occur, then it will be a very uh, good conditions because they have so uh, rich in protein that the bacteria will need that to multiply. And when it's the multiply, they can release some endotoxins and they can create uh, periapical inflammations and this will can create periodontitis, either this is with or without the lesion. So we need to understand that the main issue is always bacteria. I always uh, told to my friends, to my colleagues, that for example, if you have a broken file, the problem itself, the main problem is not the broken file. The main problem, because there is a bacteria surrounding the broken file, so we cannot clean all the bacteria surrounding the broken file, and we cannot clean the bacteria from the level of the broken file until the apical uh, regions. But the main issue was not the, the broken file. The main issue will always be uh, the bacteria. As I previously mentioned to you before, the bacteria is always the cause. For example, in this case, you can see here, there is some uh, a broken file outside the periapical area, and there is some lesion here. The problem is not the broken file. The main problem is always the bacteria inside the systems. If you try to clean all the bacteria, and if you can see here, although the broken file is there, but the lesions after one year is already getting healing. So what, what is the point in here is that uh, uh, the, the bacteria will always be the main cause of uh, the endodontic failure and problems. Then how we now uh, to proceed our endodontic treatment or how we can do our endodontic treatment nicely. First, of course, we need to have a good access cavity, and then we continue with our shipping and cleaning, and we need to seal our root canal with obturations, and last but not least, if how we do our final restorations. I want to emphasize on the final restorations, why it is important, because many of us think that uh, final uh, obturations will be the end of endodontic treatment, but it is not right, because uh, when we are when we are uh, do some obturations, it means the treatment itself is not yet finished. Because if you don't do good restorations, then I think it will be it will be it will be useless. There is a research that uh, conducted by Ula uh, Bifala and his team back in 2011 uh, that has been written in International Endodontic Journal. He said that the two, two survival is evidence on endodontically treated teeth that, that we have been treated. Uh, it can be retained for many, many years. But when it comes to extractions, the restorative issue will always be the most uh, recent of, of extractions rather than in the endodontic problem. That's why what also been written by Marjorie in 2010, that patients are not well served if we success to do our endodontic treatment, but then the tooth, it fails because of the restorative problems. And if we are seeing from the literature, we know uh, that the restorative, uh, always 73% of the problems of extractions is because of the restorative issue. So therefore, 
uh, also another uh, research that I think this is quite large because it's it is uh, it is involving more than 1.5 million endodontic treated teeth that said that good endo if it is followed by the good restorations then the survival rate has become 97 percent. So it is so obvious that if you don't do good final restorations, it means you don't have high numbers of survival. This case is quite interesting. I never see uh, this much uh, pin dentin. I don't know whether have you see this case, this kind of cases, but it is so uh, surprising because the previous dentist put so many pin over there. So uh, it, it is not a good one because the endodontic is not good and the restoration is also not good. So that's why uh, we need to understand that if we don't do uh, good final restorations, then I think it will be impossible. So, uh, but unfortunately, if we are doing our endodontic treatment, we know that how, no matter how good you do, the reductions of the tooth structure is evident. If you can see from these structures, if you can see from this literature, by doing our excess cavity, we lost 5% of stiffness. And clinical study has clearly suggested if you have more dentin, it means you have higher fracture resistance, it means you have higher retentions. So we need this dentin, we need the healthy tooth structures. That's why recently we need to think different. What is the thing different in this case? We need to think the new concept in endodontic treatment that the less is more. What is actually the less is more? If we, uh, if we are not removing that much dentin, it means we are trying to saving dentin. It means we get more beneficial in the future because the higher the resistance, because the more the structures that we have. So what is actually this less is more concept in, into dentistry? We heard many, many uh, times, we have many, many terms about the minimally invasive dentistry. And what is actually this minimally invasive dentistry is that how we can apply a systemic respect for the original tissue. And from this minimally invasive dentistry, and from this minimally invasive dentistry, then we comes with the terms of minimally invasive endodontic. Uh, there is a good uh, study, there is a good journal by Brooklyn that what he meant by minimally invasive endodontic and what we need to understand about this minimally invasive endodontic is dentin preservations. So, uh, because nobody wants to do maximally invasive endodontic, so people will try to focus on minimally invasive endodontic, but what is actually this minimally invasive endodontic is that we need to preserve our dentin as much as practical. And saving to structure generally is the most important parameter for the long term of success. We have discussed this before. The more two structures we have, it means the more retention that we can gain. And the more retentions, it means the longer the term for this tooth to survive. So it means if you are seeing this less is more concept, minimally invasive endodontic, there is not much big difference with the regular concept of endodontic treatment. We still need to do our excess cavity. We still need to shape our root canal. We need to definitely clean our root canal systems. And finally, we need to do some obturations. And therefore, if we are talking about less is more, then these four uh, procedures, we need to try to preserve as many as possible, as many as practical, uh, two structures that we need to preserve. So therefore, if we are talking about access cavity, uh, in order in, in order to fulfill this uh, less is more concept, we have to understand that the excess cavity is very important because with good excess cavity, we can permit the removal of all the chamber's content. We can permit complete and direct patients of the floor of the chamber. We can provide direct access as, 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 as direct as possible to the apical third of the canal. And uh, access is always crucial. I always said that in my opinion, access cavity is the most important. I don't care how good we can shape a very curved root canal. How can we shape as curved canals? But if you cannot find the canal through good access cavity, it means it's impossible. You cannot find anything. For example, ledge. 
How many of you have this sledge? I always found this sledge as a, a referral case that uh, is, is quite challenging for us. And we know if there is a latch, definitely there is a relationship between the dislatch formations and the failure of endodontic treatment outcomes. I want to see this, this, this uh, perspective. We know that if you are talking about ledges, the problem of the ledge is always because of instrumentations. As you can see, the etiology of the ledge from number three to number seven usually is because of the instrumentations. But let's not forget, from the number one and the number two, which is the main problem, was not the instrumentations. The main problem was always the excess cavity, how we cannot extend our excess cavity. It means we don't have an, enough sufficient uh, uh, volume. We don't have enough sufficient uh, room uh, for us to see to be able to control our instrumentations. So the problem of ledges may, may look like uh, error in our instrumentations, but actually uh, before our instrumentations, we need to create our excess cavity. And because the excess cavity problems, we can create our instrumentations problem. So what is actually good excess cavity then? What we need to achieve this good access cavity? Of course, we need straight line access, that's for sure. Number two, with straight line access, we can improve our visibility. And we can achieve our good infection control because it can create a good flow of our irrigations protocol. And then uh, we can improve our functionality. And last but not least, according to the minimally invasive endodontic, we need to preserve as much uh, as practical to structure. We need to preserve our dentin. Straight line access is always be the basic. I always said straight line access up to date, in my opinion, is always a basic because with this type of access, you can have easily uh, identify all the anatomy inside. You can improve your visibility nicely. It means uh, you don't have any problems about the visual, about the finding of the anatomy of the root canal. But the problem, according to Yomari Kram, back in 2009, as you can see here, after the carrier's removal, and then they are for, and then he followed by the excess cavity, the number of the increasing of removing hard tooth tissue, it become higher. And what he can conclude with that research, that excess cavity and the post space preparations are the procedures that during root canal treatment cause the largest loss of hard tissue structures. So, but we cannot, it's impossible that we don't do excess cavity. We must do excess cavity. But we need to understand that by doing excess cavity, we might uh, destroy the heart tooth tissue uh, with the largest number. So in 2010, uh, David Clark and John Cadmi has come up with a, 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 what we can say a modern concept of excess cavity. What is uh, this modern concept of excess cavity? And this concept, uh, from David Clark and John Kedemy has become uh, as known as what we know as CK principle, Clark and Kedemy principle. And what they said that we need to maintain to structure as much as practical and not as much as possible because it is important. And what is the meaning of as much as practical that they said we need to preserve and protect the most important area and they call it the pericervical dentin area. And why this pericervical dentin area is important? Because we know this pericervical dentin area, it is the area that can hold uh, the maximum uh, retentions of the two structures in order to uh, avoid fractures or crack in the future. And pericervical dentin is always uh, considered the most susceptible to fractures from the occlusal forces. But the questions came up, what is actually, or where is actually the pericervical dentin area? If we are seeing this, then the pericervical dentin area can be four millimeter above or can be four millimeter below the alveolar crest. So it means this eight millimeters area, it is very crucial if we want to maintain our uh, tooth structure or our healthy tooth structures in order to be able to increase our fracture resistance. Therefore, by maintaining this very cervical dentin area, then we try now to adapt this concept of minimally invasive, in which we try to do more conservative access. 
we try now to limit our access cavity. Uh, although we need to create straight on access cavity, but we try to limit uh, the removal of a more dentin to structure. And we know recently then we have many types of access cavity according to the concept of minimally invasive or less is more. We know about the conservative access cavity, and then we also know about the trust access. And then finally, we also know about the ninja access, which is a very tiny hole, or we can call it the ultra conservative access. Let's see first uh, about this each type of access cavity. The main uh, concern about this three type of access cavity or conservative access cavity, it is really have some advantages, clinical or biomechanical advantages that we should then apply to our uh, procedures in creating our endodontic access cavity. This paper, I think all of you know this paper, it is very, it's very basic and it's very uh, common. Many people use this paper uh, to justify how we need to have a, a conservative access cavity. There's a paper by Krishan back in 2014 that they do some research about the traditional and conservative access cavity uh, and their fracture resistance to those type of access cavity. And as you can see this, actually the, the, the significant numbers is only happened in the molar group. As you can see here in the incisors, yes, although the numbers is, is, is different, but it's not so, it's so that significant. The load at fractures for the incisor in traditional it is uh, 1,305 Newton. And if we are doing conservative, it's all, uh, uh, yes, they have better, but not that significant. The significance will always be in the control. But let's not forget, if you can see here, the conservative in, in molars, it means that the traditional has a fractures of 641.7 Newton. That's a pretty high numbers. And if we are replicating our uh, occlusal forces, our chewing uh, activity, usually we are not chew that hard because if we chew, usually it happens in cycle. So there is an interesting paper in 2016 uh, that they are trying to replicate our biting forces. They put some 18 extracted maxillary molars and they divide it into two groups. Number one is the uh, contracted cavities, and number two is the traditional cavities. And they both uh, shape the canals using the feet taper from SSY, and they put some restorations uh, composite, because if you see from the previous uh, previous research that had been done by Krishan, uh, the load test in this uh, research was not put any uh, restorations. So it means, I think it is, it is, it is almost impossible because uh, I think all of us, after you finish your endodontic treatment, you will follow with your restorations. So in this uh, research that uh, done in 2016, now they put some bonded composite as the, their final restorations, and they try to do it a cycle now. Now it is, it is, it is replicating our binding forces. And they cycle between 50 to 150 newtons, so it is roughly about 5 to 15 kilograms. And what is the result? There is actually, there is no significantly differences in the biomechanical responses uh, between the uh, contracted and the traditional excess cavity in the maxillary model. So it means that uh, no, uh, to, uh, whatever you do with your excess cavity, actually there is not that much different. And we need to understand if you try to do some conservative access cavity from this journal, you, you don't have any also uh, that much benefit uh, rather than saving two structures because we need to understand there's also the high chance of misconnect. And why there is a possibility of high chance of misconnect? Because if you do contracted access, you may have less visibility to your root canal anatomy. And if you don't have that much visibility. So I think it will be, it will be dangerous because you cannot see all the uh, possibility of the variations of the root canal anatomy. And not to mention, if we are doing uh, 
conservative access cavity, it is also increasing the difficulty level of our uh, instrumentations. And this is important uh, because nowadays there is a trend uh, that I follow uh, more in social media. And what is actually this trend? Uh, they try to do smaller access cavity in order just to make looks good on the social media. I need to emphasize it because we need to be careful. You may do conservative access cavity, but you need to remember there is some consequences on that. Because uh, if we have that much benefit, then we can do it. But if the benefit is not, is not that beneficial, don't try to limit your access cavity just in order to have uh, looks good on uh, the pictures. And now how about ninja access? Ninja access actually is a, like a tiny hole on the tooth that sometimes people just create a hole and put some uh, instrumentation in there. What is a, a good paper about this ninja access uh, from uh, Nick Grandi and Gianluca Protino and also his team in Journal of Endodontic? We need to believe that the traditional endodontic access cavity showed lower fracture stress. Okay, I agree with that because traditional access cavity remove more to structures comparing to the conservative. But the conservative and the ninja or the ultra conservative, they did not increase fracture strength compared to conservative. So by, limit our, by uh, limit, limiting our access, traditional access cavity just into conservative access cavity is enough. We don't need to do ninja access because we definitely have a visibility uh, it's very low and I don't know if you are high skilled clinician I think you might be able to do in a in, in a perfect way but there is not something that regularly we can do and or we can use as a daily uh, type or our excess cavity and also uh, recently we also see truth access truth access what is actually the, the basic uh, the basic reason about truth access in truth access, we don't remove the completely the dentinal bridge because they said if we maintain the dentinal bridge, it means it can uh, increase the retentions of this tooth. But as I previously uh, stated also from the previous journal, the smaller the access cavity, the higher the difficulty level that we will gain. As you can see here, by doing truth access, and this is the traditional, you can see the instrumentations that we do in our root canal is very limited. If you don't do it carefully, you might have a fracture here because there is more coronal, coronal interference in the truss access comparing to the coronal interference in the traditional access cavity. So actually, is it really, really that good? Well, I have to say that in order to following the less is more concept, the minimally invasive and the daunting. I agree that we now need to limit our access cavity. We need to make it smaller or we need to make it more conservative. But once again, access is always a dynamic process. So first, if we do our small access cavity and with this small access cavity, we can have our vision, we can do easily our scouting, and we can manage our glyph path, then it's fine. You can do your shaping and it means you are okay. But if you do small access cavity and you don't have much uh, good for vision and you cannot do any scouting or even create glyph path with an easy way, then it means don't try this and don't continue with this type of access. We need to create a bigger access cavity. So the point is not just make just small, but the point is here because access cavity is the entrance, entrance to do the next procedure, the next step of our endodontic treatment. If we don't uh, get all the beneficial that we can, that we need for fusion, for scouting, for glide path, for shaping, then I think it is useless we try to maintain small access cavity. But of course, smaller access cavity or uh, minimally invasive access cavity now is our priority, but not to be uh, trapped by the concept that we have to make it as small as possible. We need to make it as small as practical. 
So you can see here, uh, this is the maxillary motor. I try to, uh, if we try to make, let's say, conservative access cavity, yes, you can see mesiobuccal, distal buccal, palatal here. But don't forget, if you take it differently, if we try to modify it a little bit by creating a little bit bigger of our excess cavity, you might see differently. There is a niche buckle too over there. And if you don't do this type of excess cavity, you try to maintain this type of excess cavity, you might have a missed canal of the MB2. So once again, minimally invasive uh, or, or conservative access cavity is always our priority. But once again, it is a dynamic concept. So if you cannot have it with this smaller access cavity, it means we need to increase it. We need to make it bigger. So because if we are trying to make it bigger, we will have more beneficial. We can finish our uh, treatment objective of endodontic treatment, which is clean all the systems entirely and then seal all the systems. So uh, I want us now to just think about conservative access cavity as our priority, but not as small as possible, but as small as practical. And if we're still talking about the access cavity, there were some important message that I would like to share with you. There are four important things that we need to underline if we want to create our access cavity. First is how about the carriers? Second, where is the entry point should we, where should we uh, start? And usually the chamber depth is always a problem. And last but not least, how we can create our outline. I want to discuss about first things, which is the carriers. Remember, before we entry into our root canal systems, all the carriers must be free. And how uh, we need, and, and how if the carriers is not clean? So it means you cannot start your endodontic treatment because carriers is always contain some bacteria. And our intention is to clean bacteria inside the root canal systems. So how can you clean your root canal systems if the entrance is still full of bacteria? So that's why we need to do, do we need to clean all the carriers before we create our access cavity. And second, how about the entry point? If possible, I always say in 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 any cases, if you can see the central fossa, I will say always start from the central fossa. But there is, uh, of course, there is sometimes uh, uh, conditions that we cannot do that because maybe the carriers was already so huge that the central fossa has destroyed. But as long as you can see the central fossa, always try to start from the central fossa. How about also in the interior teeth? In the interior teeth, try to start it in the middle of the palatal surface and don't forget to respect the cingulum and the incisal edge. Now, third things is about the chamber tap. There is the differentiations between the interior and the posterior tooth about the chamber tap. Why is this important? Because the interior, as we know by the, uh, by the evidence or by the study, they said the interior has a differences with, uh, between the posterior because the cemento enamel junctions that usually represent the ceiling of the pop chambers in the posterior, it will not happen in the interior. And usually the level in the interior, we note that the top of uh, the ceiling of the pop chamber actually was more occlusal to the cemento enamel junctions. So if you can see, this is the line of the cemento enamel junctions. The roof is not in here like the posterior. The roof is, is a little bit more occlusal through this line. And then this is the roof. So we need to understand the differences between the interior and the posterior. And usually the target area, uh, according to this uh, journal, we need to take line from this B line. B line is the cemento enamel junctions from the labial to the palatal, and this is the A line. And take the midpoint in the B sections, and you can you take the midpoint in the A sections, and this is usually the C line. This is usually the depth of the entrance of the pub chamber of the interior teeth. And how about the posterior? 
first year, in my opinion, is a little bit, a little bit easier to, uh, to judge what is the positions of the pop chamber. Many, many journals said that if we are draw the line from the cemento enamel junctions, usually this is the line that match with the floor or with the roof of the pop chamber. So when you hit your burst in the cemento enamel junctions, it means you are already reaching the pop chamber. So the depth of the insertions of your burst will be stopped at the cemento enamel junctions. Don't go further beyond that because you might create a perforations. And last things is the outline, because I still see many cases that came to my office that the outline of the access cavity was wrong. Sometimes I can see a round outline access cavity in a mandibular molar or sometimes in a maxillary molar. Because if you don't create good outline, it means you also have uh, bad visibility of your uh, endodontic treatment. So for example, if you are uh, draw the line from the mandibular molar. Always take a midline from the buccal to lingual in this groove. And then you take also one from or two millimeter from the mesial line. And this is the area that we should create our uh, access cavity in the mandibular molar. And when you take a bird to create outline, we need to take from the mesial buccal to the mesial lingual and then to the mesial lingual and the distal, and then from the distal, take it to the mesial buckle until we create some outline that we need to create uh, in our endodontic treatment. As you can see here, and this is the outline uh, for the mandibular molar. It is what I can say, this is the conservative access cavity, but we need to understand the importance. Although we create a conservative access cavity, we still can see how we can maintain our pericervical dentin in this area, but we still have a good visibility. We still have gain control until the, peri, uh, until the apical area without any uh, much coronal interference. I can still put my K file directly into the apical foramen without any much coronal interference at the top, in which we can say, uh, we try to maintain as much as practical to structure, but not forgetting the essence of access cavity in which we need to gain control of the endodontic root canal systems underneath it. And this outline, uh, it means by we need to enlarge our uh, outline because it is so necessary. How about this? If you see this, you try to make it minimally access cavity, but you don't create uh, enough enlargement, then you will have some coronal interference in here and it will be easily to create latch at the apical area. So enlargement is always important. Usually I suggest us to do enlargement either with a safe ended burr, or you can do if you are uh, already a good skill clinician, then also you can use your just regular diamond burr to do some enlargement and create a good outline access cavity. So we should, start from our penetrations. Of course, we need to use our round bird to create our penetrations starting from the, uh, from the entry point that we have discussed before. After we're reaching the pop chamber, don't forget this is the mid -li mid -line, uh, midpoint of the line A. This is the midpoint of the line B. If you take this is the depth of the pop chamber. And then after you do some penetrations, we need to create enlargement to create an access outline form and have a good flow in order to reach, uh, to reach the working length or the apical area. But make sure you need to check if there is any overhanging that maybe it can trap some residual part at the corner. Uh, you can use your indoor explorer to check is there any some uh, pop, as you can see there is some pop tissue over there and it will definitely endanger our restorations protocol because it might uh, have a good fit with that and it might create leakage in the future. And usually my favorite is to do some refinement. But if you want to use uh, refinement, if you want to do refinement, don't use with the high speed burst. We need to use with the ultrasonic. It means we need to try to maintain as, as, as conservative as possible because with the high speed, definitely you will destroy more to structure. And this is the outline form of the maxillary central incisor, as you can see. 
we still can try to do some conservative access cavity without forgetting the enlargement. And we can still gain the apical control area uh, without any, any uh, coronal uh, interference at, at the coronal portions. And we still can maintain our pericervical dentin in a, uh, in a good way as well as practical. So after we creating our access cavity, of course, the second things that we need to do is to shape our root canal systems. Uh, because uh, shaping as a part of uh, our root canal preparations is always important. So if you are talking about root canal in, uh, preparations, it is a procedure that is involving to preparing our root canal systems to be obturated. And it means if you are talking about preparations, we of course uh, talk about instrumentations. Uh, in these instrumentations, we need to create some volume uh, in order the volume to can cope with our irrigations protocol. In this case, the mainly is sodium hypochlorite. And then how we can activate this sodium hypochlorite in order to clean and digest all the tissue inside of the root canal systems. I just want to share, I think all of you know this uh, concept of uh, shaping. This has been uh, uh, introduction by Herbert Schilder back in 1960. Uh, I think it is a revolutionary because back in 1960, uh, Schilder's already to think about a concept that we apply up to date about how we need to design our objective of shaping, how we can, how we should uh, create our uh, tapering instrumentations, how we should create a funnel shape from the access cavity to the apex, how the cross-sectional diameter should be narrower every point apically, how we can uh, do our instrumentations, our preparations with following the flow of the original ships of the root canal, and how we should maintain our apical foramen in its position, and the final step is the most important that how we should keep our apical foramen as small as practical. Once again, this is almost the same with the access cavity, how we should maintain it as small as practical and not, and not as small as possible. Children also understand about this. That's why he didn't say we should maintain apical foramen as small as possible or as small as number 20 or 25 or 30 or 35, because every case is different. That's why we need to think about as small as practical all the time. I just want to take us just a brief history about um, uh, instrumentations. Uh, if we are see about instrumentations, first endodontic instrument has been introduced back, in, uh, back, back at that time by Edward Maynard. And in 1885, uh, there is Gitz drill. So Gitz Clinton drill has been there for a long, long time. And then in 1889, uh, the first endodontic handpiece was created at that time by Rollins, uh, but it's, uh, it is rotations, 360 degree rotations, but it's only limited to 100 RPM. And at that time, it is to avoid uh, fractures of the instruments. And then this continue in 1928, uh, there is a contra angle by WNH. Also in 1964, Micromega has come up with the Geromatic. I think uh, some of you know maybe about the Geromatic. Uh, Geromatic is already reciprocal motions in, 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 uh, that, in the directions. And then we came up with a year of 1999. At that time, it is what we call the night time era. Uh, we have a new material, nickel titanium, that has been a replace, uh, replacement for stainless steel instruments uh, because this night, uh, nickel titanium has more uh, advantages comparing to the stainless steel instrument at the time. Also, with this year of 1999, uh, with the night eye coming up, uh, we know the paradigm of early coronal enlargement concept at that time. What is mean by early coronal enlargement? It means that we need to remove coronal interference before we use our rotary instrumentations. Or at that time, we heard terms about pre flare or orifice opener, because we need to remove the coronal interference in this area in order to have a straighter, a straighter angle of our instruments insertions. So that means we don't have any coronal interference and we will have gain control uh, easier in the apical part of the canal. And then after the early coronal enlargement came up, then people came up also with the new instruments coming in the market. Uh, now there, there are uh, new uh, 
technique of shaping, we know, we know about selective coronal enlargement. Actually, there is not much driven to the early coronal enlargement, but selective coronal enlargement, uh, usually they came up with, uh, with NITI instrumentations. There is some pre preliminary enlargement in this coronal area, and it's usually it's carried out by instrument that has a greater taper at the coronal. So while the ships, they also create some uh, coronal enlargement at that time. Some of the instruments that we understand at that time is pro taper, for example. We know there is an SX in which XS is, is used to enlarge, uh, pre to, to create preliminary enlargement. So by doing this, we can, we can change the angle of insertions of our file into a straighter angle of insertions. But at that time, uh, the point of the selective coronal enlargement is that we, we need to make our instrumentations can reach the length uh, without any interference at the, at the top and we should create space for irrigants because irrigants will clean the systems. But the problem, how big we should create in order to have some active, uh, effective, effectiveness of the irrigants for, uh, to work to clean all the systems. And we see from uh, many textbooks, we know that uh, some of them are recommended more than 25. So we can do at least 30, at 35, this is also, uh, some journals that said that apical preparations, uh, of course, it will affect the irrigant replacement. So root canal enlargement to size larger than 25 is appeared to be improved the performance of silence uh, irrigations. But we need to remember that our root canal anatomy is not round in diameter. How about this? You want to touch the whole of this? You want to touch the whole of this? I think it's impossible. I think even you use 120K file, it will not touch that thing. So what, what, what we think about uh, our root canal that it, maybe it's not, it's, it's round, it is completely wrong because most uh, physiological foramen of our root canal is not round, but it's oval. So if it is oval, so it means we cannot touch all the area of our root canal by our instrumentations because mostly, not mostly, but all our instruments are round. So like this, it is not round, it's oval. But if you want to create a round like this, so it means we need to remove more dentin to structures, in which case, now we need to understand, now we need to try to limit uh, ourselves to remove as much as practical our dentin or our tooth structure. So the questions uh, always exist. What kind of instrumentations, what size of instrumentation should I uh, put to have uh, enough uh, space for the irrigations to work? That the answer will be, there is no magic number as Hilder said. It's got as small as practical is always be the answer. And no matter how, how, how uh, what type of brand, what type of taper, what type of size the instrument you use, According to the evidence, 15 to 30 percent of the root canal walls was remain untouched by the instrumentations. Because if we think the root canal is round, the reality is not that. The reality, they are more, more, most of the canal are irregulars. Sometimes uh, it's like this. Sometimes it's like this. So it means it is impossible for our instrumentations to touch all the canal walls, as you can see. And it's like this. What do you want to do? You, you see, this is, it is already so thin. What do you want to do with this? You want to make it like that or with creating some stripping perforations or you just want to maintain this big and do more cleaning in this area? Because the problem, uh, the root canal is not round. It is more, more, more likely it is oval. And even there is a journal that has been put in 1956 that the poorer long-term result uh, prognosis happens with the larger apical preparations. And this is also that the crack was observed when we used larger file, uh, because if you're using rotary files with a large number, it could potentially cause a crack on the apical surfaces. As you can see here, there is a crack if we, if we do it too large, like this. It is too large and there is a crack over there. This is a case, when you see this case, when you think this is only some regular uh, apical lesions, no, this is not just a lesion, a lesion. This is caused by a crack, 
a vertical root crack, which is this two, this cannot be safe anymore. You need to do some extractions. And why this has happened, it could be because we put uh, too much pressure. We, we, uh, we, we put uh, too large numbers of files to do some instrumentations. This is also a paper by Saipati back, back in 2018 that increasing the tapering of root canal preparations can detrimentally affect the tooth fracture resistance. As you can see, the, the, the bigger the taper, it will create a possibility of higher chance of uh, crack in the uh, root area. So in order to be again, to fulfill the last is more concept that now we need to think about that differently. So instrumentations definitely need to meet the challenges. It needs to design the preserve structural strength. It's also to provide us with good flexibility and efficiency, and it should be comfortable for use. It should be smooth, effortless, and simple to use. So therefore, nowadays, we know about the simultaneously technique. What it means by the simultaneously technique, we don't need to use larger numbers of files to create a smooth transitions of tapering uh, of the taper shapings. We can use our small instruments first, but at the same time, we can create uh, enough room to remove coronal interferences to allow uh, bigger instruments to go and advance into the apical area. Because with the smaller files, not the larger files, we can leave the tip freely during rotations without any interference at the coronal part. And also, in order to have provide us with the good flexibility, we now had more advantages uh, by having new metallurgy. As you know, as you all know, we now have a cold night time, and also we now have a blue night time. So I'm going to introduce you with the VDW rotate. Some of you might say this is the new M2. Well, actually, no, because it's different in material. It is slightly different in uh, in design and also in, in sizing. Uh, but one thing for sure now, it's made from the blue night eye wire. What I also like about the VDW Rotate, because it now has a shorter shank. It's 11 millimeter in uh, handle, because the shorter shank allow us to gain more space when we are dealing with, the, let's say, uh, posterior, let's say, uh, maxillary second molar on the left side, which is, it is sometimes we need to gain in one millimeter uh, more space. It's, 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 it means a whole lot difference. And it's also have a new, uh, it's almost have a similar escrow sections with the more adaptive uh, design. And now we don't have any more the 1004. Now we go with the 1504 as the client path creations. And we can continue with the 2005, not the 2006, like we have in, in uh, M2, which is smaller in taper to preserve uh, more dentin to structures. And then now we have options of 2506 or the 2504. 2504 is something that I really admire or I really like the most because we can have, we can gain the 25 at the apical with the size, uh, with the tip size, but we can still maintain the uh, a smaller taper in order to uh, preserve more dentin to structures. But since it's still 4% taper, we still can gain some efficiency of our irrigations to work up to the apical area. So once again, this is the VDW rotate. Usually you start with the 1504, continue with 2005, and then you can continue with 2506, or if it is, let's say, a narrow or curved canals, you can continue with the 2504, before 2506. So the same things also happens with, with, with all the other instruments uh, uh, technique. You need to create, we need to create adequate access cavity and scalpers using the 10K file just to make sure it's there and uh, make sure you, you, you already create your working length by using your apex locator. And remember, always uh, start your rot rotary instrument with the full fluid canal because it can helps uh, our rotary instruments to work better. So first we need to create client pad using the 1504 into the working link. Uh, don't forget just smoothly, uh, 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 gentle smooth using it. Do not push. You, you can use a light brushing motions to create a, a, a coronal enlargement to remove more coronal interference. 
Don't forget to do some evocations uh, and you can continue with the 2005 and then you can continue with the 2506 for the majority of the case. But for the highly curved canals or maybe it's very narrow, then you can continue with 2504 rather than the 2506. So this is the case that I'm uh, starting to use with the VDW rotate. As you can see, this is the mandibular first molar. So I started with the 1504. You can see smoothly insert your uh, files. Do not push because rotation gives us easier to go uh, to, to progress apically. And I also don't use my extirpation needle anymore. I don't use my barb brooch because it is very dangerous. As you can see here, rot rotary instruments can easily extirpate your pulp. So you don't need to use more barb brooch because it can cut dentin and it will create problems. Don't forget always full fluid canal and continue with the 2005. You can see smoothly. It is very comfortable to use. It is very smoothly. Uh, you don't need to push. You can do a little bit light brush to create uh, more coronal enlargement. Don't forget to flush, to irrigate. Once again, always full fluid canal. And now you can continue with 2506. Since this is a distal canal, it is quite big. I don't need to use my 2504. So from 20, 2005, I can directly jump into 2506. So when if, if you, some of you have been used with the M2 because I, I used to be an M2 user for many, many uh, years. Uh, we need at that time four instrument. Uh, with this VDW rotate, you only need three instruments to finish a complete shapings of your root canal. And after that, uh, don't forget to just activate your irrigants. In this case, I'm going to use my eddy as my sonic activations to clean all the systems uh, to activate my sodium hypochlorite. And then after that, this is the final shape of the emisio buckle, emisio lingual, and distal buckle. And then this is after the uh, obturations. As you can see, it can maintain uh, the curvature is quite nice. There is not much change. The flow of the original flow can be uh, can be followed nicely without any regularities. So, if we are talking about the instrumentations in this last is more concept, Shielder already mentioned back in 1960 that he said keep your apical diameter as small as practical, that not as small as possible, but as small as practical. So once again, if you are talking about shaping, it's the same things if you are talking about the less is more concept with the excess cavity, that the shaping is also a dynamic concept. We need to remember that shaping is to create volume because shaping is not to clean your canal. Uh, irrigant will work to clean your canal, but shaping will work to create a uh, volume for the irrigants to flow into the length of the canal to do some cleaning. If we create some volume and we think it is enough for our irrigations to flow into the length, it means your, irrig your shaping is done. But if you want to have a, uh, if you think that it is not enough to make your irrigants go into the length, so it means you need to have a bigger shaping. But of course, we need to think that small shaping, if it is already enough, then you don't need to make it bigger because we want to create less than the removal. So for example, and this is the case that I've been worked at the time with the M2 because at the time there is still no uh, rotate. And in this typical of distal canals, I can stop only in until 1505. But I can make it a larger taper at the, at the coronal. Even I use 1505, if I put my little brushing, so I understand I will not create 1505. Maybe I create at the time 6% taper, not 5% taper, because I introduce a brushing motions to create more coronal enlargement. And why I need to do that? Because I want to make it a, a funnel or taper enough to make my irrigants can go uh, into the root canal and have a better 
flow into the land and clean the systems. So, for example, if you want to do this with 2506, you might uh, hit reaching the length, but you have a very high chance of fracturing the instruments, or maybe you have a high chance of creating latch. Remember, Shielder always said, as small as practical. So it means if you think it is enough to be able to accept our irrigants into the length, so it means it is enough, we don't need to make it bigger. So as a part of root canal preparations, so now we can talk about uh, our, uh, our cleaning protocols or our irrigations protocol. Because if you are talking about cleaning and disinfected systems, it is always, always a part of preparations. You can see here, on the left side, it is an original root canal space. On the right side, it is an instrumented canal, uh, root canal. If we combine these two image, you still can see there is a green line and the red fine area. So this is the area that our instrumentations cannot touch. So if you remember, I don't care what kind of brand, what kind of size or taper your instruments you use, but still there is a 15 to 30 percent of the area in the root canal that has not been touched by our instruments. So it is impossible, it is impossible be, uh, to remove all the bacteria because once again, it's a system. So we need something to help us understand uh, that we need to be able to clean more inside the systems. There is a good paper by uh, Jose Siquera. He is, I think um, some of you, or maybe all of you know who, who is Jose Siquera. Uh, in the Journal of Aeronautic 2008, he mentioned clearly that we all have a threshold. Our immune systems have a threshold. If the number of the bacteria inside the root canal systems is go past beyond this threshold, then the symptoms will occur, both clinically or radiographically. So what we need to do with our endodontic treatment, with, with our uh, preparation, shaping, and cleaning, we need to reduce the number of the bacteria up into the level below the tree school. Because it is impossible for us, as like what the secret has said, because it is impossible for us to uh, reach at the zero level. Therefore, we need to reach our goal, which is we need to reduce our bacteria populations inside to the root canal just to a level below its necessary just in case we need to do that in order to, the, the, to induce or uh, to sustain the thesis. If what we do has not passed beyond the threshold, for example, we do only in this area, so it means we don't do good enough shaping and cleaning or maybe obturations, it means the clinical symptoms is there. But if we do uh, make the bacteria populations go below the threshold line, so definitely we will, we will get a healing, but we will not be able, impossible for us to teach this level, to reach this level, because root canal systems will not be able to be sterilized. That's why what we know is about the terms of disinfections rather than sterilizations, because sterilizations of the root canal is almost impossible to achieve. If you are speaking about the infections of the root canal, you know, a primary root canal infections is caused by the bacteria. Uh, there is some paper that they are uh, conducting research about what type of bacteria that usually exist in the field of root canal treatments. Usually most of them are streptococci and it's uh, enterococcus. Also, there is some yeast inside the root canal that has been filled uh, endodontically 3DT. So usually once again, this bacteria, usually they always uh, there and they always perform in the biofilm state because biofilm state, it is, it is a state that is more favorable to the bacteria, but unfortunately, this is the state that is more difficult for us to clean and to remove. As you can see here, uh, usually the bacteria is usually, it's, it's still, it's there and it is isolated by uh, the periapical lesions or the granulations tissue, which is, it is more difficult for us to clean. So, if we are talking about the preparations, I'm, I'm not going to be bored to saying this, but what 
we can do with our instrument is only we shape the canals. We did not clean the canals with our instrument. But if we want to do some cleaning, we will definitely need our irrigations to work to clean all the systems. That's why file do not clean the canals. There is an interesting paper in 1987 by Craig Baumgartner at that time. He used a single canal by Caspit and they scrapped only one side of the canals. So from the round canals, they scrapped each side with instrument and the, the other side, they did not do any instrumentations. So then they continue to use the four types of irrigations. They use saline, they also use sodium hypochlorite, they use EDTA, and they use the combinations of sodium hypochlorite and EDTA. And then after that, they split the two and they evaluate it with the scanning electron microscope. Interestingly, if you can see the conclusions from this research, if we use only sodium hypochlorite as the only irrigants, the pulpa remnants and the predentin were removed from the uninstrumented part. So the instrumented part of the canal that's scrapped with our instruments, in fact, it will it they don't uh, they don't clean. It's still there. The debris is still there. The dentin predentin is still there. So therefore, if we are using only sodium hypochlorite, this is confirming that the files do not clean the canals because the site that has been touched by the instruments, even we use sodium hypochlorite, the debris is still there and it cannot be cleaned. But if we use both sodium hypochlorite and EDTA as the combinations, we can see here the result. Both instrumented and uninstrumented halves of the root canal are clean if we are using sodium hypochlorite and EDTA. So it is clear we need to use the combinations with the sodium hypochlorite and EDTA as our irrigations, uh, irrig uh, irrigations um, protocol and, irrig uh, and irrigants and instruments whatsoever, they do not clean the canals. And therefore, only 15 max, uh, to 30 uh, percent of the canal still remain untouched of the instrument. For example, like this, what you think we can do with instruments, we cannot clean this area. You can say this is 2506. We can touch this if we do it, let's say 3005, or maybe you can do it with 2508. No, it will not touch this area because there is some restrictions in this area it, it makes the instruments here will not touch in this area. It's only touched in this area. So it means this area has never been touched by our instruments. So the one who touched that and the one who cleans that will always be our irrigation protocol. So what is the principle of our irrigations? First, we need to choose what kind of needle size that we should choose or we should use uh, in order uh, to fulfill our size of preparations of the root canal. In 1983, Chow has made some research that if we do our instrumentations of our canal using size 15, it is impossible. There is There are no uh, needle that can reach this uh, size of the canal up to the working length. But if we create our size, even if it is 20 or 25 or maybe 30, it is enough. We can use our 30G of irrigation needle to reach the apex. So once again, what Schindler said, as small as practical, I think once again, it's matched with this uh, research. Even you do 20 or 30, it doesn't much big, uh, it doesn't create that much difference. We still can use our 30G irrigations needle to reach the apex. So it, in that case, I, maybe I will stop only in 20 or maybe in 25. I don't need to destroy or I don't need to uh, remove uh, more dentin to, to, to maintain uh, more dentin to structure. So this, this, this paper uh, has taught us that for sure you don't need to use uh, 25 or maybe 30 23 or maybe 28. So the number that we need to stick with the irrigations needle is our 30G irrigations needle. 
And depth is always important because once again, this is uh, also the journal in 2005 that they are conducting a research using the bioluminescence bacterial count. If you see here, uh, the color, it means it's indicate the number of the bacteria. So if the color goes red, it means the number of bacteria is high. So if the, if the color is blue, it means the number of the bacteria is low. And they divided the group into two groups. Group number one, if they insert their uh, irrigation needle up to one millimeter from the working length. And the group number two, how if they insert uh, their irrigation needle five millimeter from the working length. And then from these two groups, they divided into four subgroups. Group A, in which the canal, uh, the, the tooth uh, as a control group, it means there is no bacteria. And the second subgroups, which is the group B, it is a tooth that they try to grow bacteria after culturing. As you can see here, the color is so red. Uh, it means the bacteria count is high. It means all the bacteria is there. And the subgroup C, when they do some irrigations with three millimeter irrigations and they are using 20 Hg at that time, uh, this is the one millimeter from the working length and this is the five millimeter from the working length. So what you can see from these two images that the closer you get to the apex, the better the cleaning we, we can get into our root canal systems. And this is the subgroups four, which is the subgroups D. If we are using six millimeter irrigations with 28 G irrigating needle, and this is one millimeter from the working length, and this is the five millimeter from the working length. Once again, you can see that the number of the bacterial count is less uh, significantly less in the group of one millimeter from the working length comparing with the group of five millimeter from the working length. But not just the length, it is important. You can see here, actually, it is the number of volume of our irrigants is also important. By adding more volume from three millimeter to the six millimeter in the same group, we will have the lower number of bacterial count inside the root canal systems. So I'm going to, to introduce you the Eriflex. Eriflex is the new irrigation needle that uh, I am now trying uh, trying to use, and now I'm regularly use this as my irrigation needle. And uh, you and you can also use this uh, irrigation needle because it is so good. It is uh, 30g in sizes, but it has a 4% stapler. It has a two side fented and most importantly, it creates from the, it made from the soft propylene, which is a plastic. That's why it is so flexible. And they can create some free lateral forces into the canal to create more shear stress forces. And trust me, it is so effortless. But what I can give you as a hint, if you use this type of irrigation needle or if you use irreflexes, remember to dispense your irrigants outside your root canal systems. So do not dispense the irrigants while the, in, in the needle inside the root canal systems because it will easily to clock on the tip and you cannot do, uh, you cannot have a smooth irri uh, irrigation uh, flow of the needle. As you can see here, when I use irreflex because it's so smooth, it is easily to reach the working length without any uh, any pressure and it's dentin friendly because it will not touch the dentin comparing to the metal irrigation needle and it's very easily adapt and it's very uh, you can insert it as close as to the apex and is so effortless then you you might have it uh, enjoy with you when you're using this irrigation needle and what is so also important about uh, cleaning our canal systems as, you, as, as we all know that our tooth is uh, close into the bone socket. So when it close into the bone socket, our root canal systems will work as it is a closed end channel or you can say a closed system. It is not an open system. Open system is like the one you can see here. It is an open system. What I mean by open systems, there is no, there is no uh, cl closing here. So when you irrigate, your irrigants can go pass through that exit area because it's not, it's not a closed system. But it is different with our root canal. Since it is inside the bone socket, so it will react like a closed end channel or a closed system. So 
when we use our sodium hypochlorite as our mainly irrigant irrigation solutions to dissolve tissues and kill bacteria, when the sodium hypochlorite contact with the tissue, it will digest the tissue and it will evaporate some oxygen. And with this it happens, usually, sometimes we might have what we know as a vapor lock or what also we know as a bubble trap. So there is a bubble inside there. It means that the irrigations cannot reach the length because there is some uh, bubble trap there that the irrigants cannot penetrate it into the apical area. This is quite important because, for example, I try to close this block uh, with some composite so it will react as a closed system. And I'm going to use my irrigation 30G uh, made from metal. As you can see, I cannot hardly reach the apex and I cannot clean this apical area because it is a closed system. But if I use Iriflex, since it is easily to catching up the apex, you can see it is easy to remove the debris into the apical area, even though it is still a closed system. So that's why it is quite important for us to understand that the depth of our irrigation needle, the size of our irrigation needle, it is also uh, important and is also crucial because it will decide it, uh, the efficiencies of our irrigation protocol. And we need to understand the bottom line of our objective of our irrigations and that we need to dissolve any organic and or inorganic tissue because the, if you left some tissue there, it will become uh, nutrition for the bacteria to grow because bacteria need the protein that, will, that they can get from the tissues that we left behind inside our root canal systems. Therefore, sodium hypochlorite by chance is the only material that can digest, that can kill bacteria, that can solve tissue. This is the journal that has been uh, researched about many irrigation solutions from the sodium hypochlorite, from the chlorhexidin, hydrogen peroxide, parasitic acid, and also citric acid. And what they can say, none of the solutions except sodium hypochlorite that have any substantial capacity to dissolve any tissue. So therefore, we need to uh, consider that sodium hypochlorite is a must use irrigation solutions for our irrigation protocol for the endodontic treatment. And if you are talking about the capacity of the sodium hypochlorite to digest tissue, we know the fresher the tissue, it has a, a most rapid dissolutions. And if we are dealing with the necrotic tissue, uh, the soft uh, timing of the sodium hypochlorite was less comparing to the fresh tissue. And the uh, uh, longest time to take to digest is the fixed tissue. So if we are talking about the sodium hypochlorite, usually the main topic or the main uh, debate was the concentrations. I always said concentrations is also important. And we know uh, for sure if we are talking about the concentrations of this uh, sodium hypochlorite, the higher the concentrations, the better it is. As you can see here, if you use only 1% of sodium hypochlorite, they need to contact for 20 minutes to be able to kill all the phycalis inside the root canal systems. But if you use 5% of sodium hypochlorite, you only need less than 30 seconds to clean all the phycalis inside our root canal systems. So this is clear that the higher the concentrations of the sodium hypochlorite, the better the result and the faster itself to digest all the tissue inside the root canal systems. Also, if we are asking a survey uh, that has been done by American Association of Endodontics, uh, all of the members, majority of all the members are using more than 5% concentrations of sodium hypochlorite. Uh, it means that the higher, the, the, the fuller strength of sodium hypochlorite, it is also important. And this is the classical guidelines that usually people use. Uh, the minimum volume is one to two millimeter each time of irrigations. Uh, we need to also improve apical efficiency of our irrigations that we need. That's why we need to use our 
patency file as our apical patency for protocols. And we need to use at least 30 minutes of sodium hypochlorite to reach a good cleaning. This is also has been done that 30 minutes of sodium hypochlorite are necessary. But once again, do we really need to, to spend our time uh, like this long to achieve complete or to achieve uh, predictable cleaning uh, protocols? Therefore, we need to understand even this, this, this you know, they're just not suggesting 30 minutes, but they are suggesting 40 minutes. So what we will, we will do with 40 minutes? It's not as uh, it's a short time, 40 minutes, a long time. So you just want to sit there for 40 minutes and with the sodium hypochlorite works and digest and the, your patients open their mouth for 40 minutes for nothing. This is important, why? Because time also uh, works together with the volume in order to have efficiency of our irrigation solutions. But what I want to highlight, it is very nice uh, research uh, from the uh, Marcus Hapasalo and his team that they did a research for one day old biofilms and three weeks old biofilms and they used sterile chlorhexidine sodium hypochlorite 2 and 6% and they put exposures time of 3 minutes, 10 minutes and 30 minutes. For sure, the answer was clear. 6% was the most effective. So as I mentioned you before about the concentrations, the higher the concentrations, the better it is. So I am suggesting you to use the higher concentrations of sodium hypochlorite. My, I'm using 5.25%, but if I, if sometimes I can buy the 6% sodium hypochlorite, because there is not much uh, factory that sold 6% sodium hypochlorite for in, uh, irrigations of endodontic, but if there is 6%, then definitely I will use my 6%. But not just the concentrations that I found it interesting in this paper. As you can see here, if we are using 6% of sodium hypochlorite for three minutes exposure, they can kill 54% of bacteria. If we put 10, minute, 10 minutes, it can kill 75% of bacteria. If we put 30 minutes, like we know from the previous journal or from the previous research, we can kill 80%, which is a higher number comparing to three minutes. But let's not think uh some conclusions easily if you want to divide it for the first three minutes they can kill 54 percent so it means for the zero to three minutes our sodium hypochlorite can kill and digest 80 percent per minute but from three to ten minutes it is only three percent per minute and for 10 to 30 minutes it's only 0 0.25 percent per minute so it means it is not depend on how long you put your sodium hypochlorite, uh, but it is also depends on how frequent we exchange and refresh our sodium hypochlorite. For example, if I change and refresh my sodium hypochlorite for each minute, so one minute I change into the fresh one, one minute I change into the fresh one, which is 80% per minute, we don't need 10 minutes to clean all the bacteria. So it means time is important, I agree with that, but not just the timing, but also the concentrations of the uh, sodium hypochlorite, the volume of the sodium hypochlorite, but most of all, how frequent we exchange and how frequent we refresh our uh, irrigations uh, of sodium hypochlorite inside the canal. And last but not least, what also can be applied to improve the efficiency of the sodium hypochlorite, of course, is some activations. Activation has been known widely and has been accepted widely. It is also important to increase uh, the efficiency of the sodium hypochlorite. Like what we can see in this journal in 2010, we know that the effect of activations on the tissue softened was the greater than the temperature. And if you do continuously agitate your sodium hypochlorite inside the canal, it will result the fastest tissue dissolutions inside the canal. So it means agitations or activations is one of the methods that we must or we, sh we must use and apply for our sodium hypochlorite so they can work better inside the canal. So how we can do our activations? First technique that I'm sure all of us, many of us, maybe all dentists can use this, 
because you don't need a high-tech instrument. All you need is just a cutter percha and you, knew, you need to do what we know about the manual dynamic activation. It means that by using our cutter percha, we need to insert our cutter percha into the root canal and we need to activate our cutter percha inside the root canal up and down in order to have better uh, effect of the solvent of sodium hypochlorite. So you can see here, if you are comparing the manual dynamic activations, uh, that they said that the manual dynamic activations is better than just we use only regular silage irrigations. So it means we need to also apply more activations into our irrigants. As you can see, if I put my carapacha, you can see directly by doing it up and down, by activating our carapacha inside the root canal, you can have lateral pressures into the accessories canal. So this irrigants can clean all the systems uh, by doing this, they will press inside all the anastomosis, all the isthmuses, all the accessories, if they are existed in our root canal systems. So, but if you just put your irrigants there and you don't do any activations, the irrigants will stay there. So we need something to activate in order in a shorter time, we will have the same effect like if you put it in a longer time. So manual dynamic activation is just a technique, a basic technique that we can apply. What else that we can use? Of course, if we want to use it uh, with some technology, or if we want to use it with a better predictability, of course, we need to use it our ultrasonic. Because ultrasonic, as has been uh, showed by evidence, it has a trem tremendous effect on cleaning. You can see I put uh, some dye in this one canal of premolar and this one canal in, in premolar. And now I'm going to use my ultrasonic tip inside the canal and try to activate. As you can see, this is my ultrasonic tip. And once I activate it, you can see there is a pressure of the dye as our irrigation solutions that goes laterally and clean all the isthmuses between this canal and those canals. So this is something that we need to be aware that it has happened in our systems because root canal is not just a canal, it is a system. And if you just put it like this, you don't apply any activations. There is no, there is no pressure laterally comparing if you put into this area. But if you put maybe both this and this area, as you can see it, now I'm putting my ultrasonic in this area. Now in this side, they try to press laterally and clean the isthmuses better. You can see it. Now it's continue to con have a continuous connection between one canal and the other canals. So this is a system that definitely we need to put attention on to cleaning. Our shaping cannot clean this area. What can our shaping do is to create this volume so our irrigants can go in into the length and we can do some activations to activate our irrigants into the uh, area that cannot be penetrated with just normal uh, technique of irrigation protocol. So we know why we need to have this type of activations because uh, most of the failure of our endodontic treatment usually they can they, it caused by the persistent apical periodontitis. And usually if there is some persistent apical periodontitis, usually there is a present of microorganism inside the root canal. And the majority usually if there is some isthmuses, as you can see, this is the mesiobacal and this is the mesiolingual, you can see there is some isthmuses that's still full of debris and a possibility of bacteria by a historical image. So this is something that we need to put attention on. It. But the, the question is the same. Up to this moment, all the ultrasonic device that can be used to activate our root canal systems, it is made from metal. So how if we can, if we do a case like this, can I use my ultrasonic up into this level? The answer will be no, because it is dangerous. Because once you put it uh, into the curved canals and the ultrasonic tip has been blocked, it means although you can feel the vibrations, but actually there is zero vibrations at the tip because once you 
uh, once you block uh, in the middle of the uh, tip, then definitely the, the vibrations is not there anymore at the tip. So therefore, we also have some options if you want to try to activate our irrigants beside our ultrasonic is how if we can use now sonic. Because since it's sonic, we can use it with non-metal tip. We can use some plastic or poly, uh, polypropylene tip, which is also smooth and flexible. Like you can see in this tip, it is eddy. Eddy is a sonic, but it is, has a frequency of 6,000 hertz. So it is way uh, way higher comparing to the indoor activator. Uh, although it's not as high as ultrasonic, but you can see here, there is still some vapor lock or bubble trap over there caused by there is some uh, bubble trap inside our root canal systems that our irrigants cannot penetrate this. You can use activations as well. Put your eddy tips into your root canals and you need to activate it and you can see immediately, instantly, the bubble is ruptured. So we can disrupt this bubble and we can make our irrigants flow into the apical area and you can see how good the pressures of the eddy activations that can press laterally into the systems of our uh, accessories in the lateral area. So with this, we also can have same achievement of cleaning with maybe ultrasonic. In my opinion, my, my opinion, uh, mainly in my daily practice, I'm using sonic activations more rather than the ultrasonic. Usually I use my ultrasonic if I'm dealing with my retreatment case. Uh, because in retreatment case, we know it's not just a debris. Sometimes we need to clean also the remnant of sealer. Uh, we need also to clean maybe the remnants of gutta percha. Uh, and therefore, sometimes sonic has not enough pressures to clean all this uh, remnants. Uh, that's why I need my ultrasonic. But in daily cases, I can say 80% of my activation will be based on sonic activations because I found it, uh, I can feel more with the sonic uh, comparing with the, the ultrasonic. But with, with sonic, you cannot, you cannot feel the wall of your root canal. With ultrasonic, you can feel that you are touching the wall of your root canal. That's also the differences. Once again, it is up to, up, up to uh, preference of uh, the operator. Once may be like the ultrasonic, once may be like the sonic, but in my opinion, it's better if you have both system in your practice because we know for sure we cannot rely only in one activation. Sometimes we need to rely on both activations because one possible reason that, that we spoke before that the persistence infections is usually caused by bacteria that has been staying inside the dentina tubule. Therefore, we need to penetrate our sodium hypochlorite into those area and to remove all this uh, bacteria inside those area that has been quite challenging for us. And we also are talking about the smear layer because not just the bacteria that we need to remove from our root canal species. As we know, if we are using our instrumentations, we definitely will create our smear layer. And the compensations usually, if you want to, if you want to check what is inside the smear layer, according to the Journal of Endodontic in 1975, smear layer consists not just organic and inorganic component, but it also has some bacterial component. So no matter what is that, we need also to create, uh, we need also to remove smear layer. And evidence has proven strongly said that sodium hypochlorite alone is not be able to remove the smear layer. Maybe you remember the evidence that I talked previously before, uh, when they scrapped only one half side with, with instrumentations and they left uh, the other side uh, uninstrumented. We know the side that has been uh, scrapped by instrumentations, if you use sodium hypochlorite alone, the smear layer is there. So it means we need something in combinations with the sodium hypochlorite, in this case is the EDTA. EDTA, as known as also ethylene diamine with acetic acid, is a material that we need to use to dissolve this kind of smear layer. And it's also work as the lubricants as well. But I'm going to say the effectiveness, uh, the effectivity of the EDTA in uh, antibacterial capacity is low. So for me, I would rather say EDTA has, let's say, 
uh, no bacteria effect, although it has a bacteria effect, but it's very low in numbers. I'm going to say that EDTA mostly is to remove our smear layer because it can detach the biofilms that has been adhered into our root canal walls. And in this case, if we use our EDTA, we can have a, a better cleaning in if we are using sodium hypochlorite. So EDTA will remove the smear layer and sodium hypochlorite, and then we work to clean all uh, the tissue and digest all the tissue. So what is my protocol if I want to do my uh, preparations in terms of shaping and cleaning? I'm going to use all the time sodium hypochlorite inside my root canal while I shaping. As I said before, full fluid canal all the time. So every time I insert my instrumentations, I always fill my uh, root canal with sodium hypochlorite until the shaping is done. So it means after the shaping is done, all the shapes of the canal has been there, all the taper has been there, all the final sizes has been there. Now it's time for us to enter the cleaning protocols. And what I usually use, I will go definitely using my sodium hypochlorite in conjunction with the EDTA, and I try to activate it with my ultrasonic or sonic activations. And after that, I'm going to flush everything out with, with my uh, saline solutions, and then I'm ready to do my obturations. So here is usually what I'm, uh, what I can give as a, let's not let let's say not a, a best protocols, but I can say this is the standard or the classic protocols that we can use in our irrigations protocol. So spend 15 minutes in cleaning. In this 15 minutes, I mean by cleaning uh, stages. So. After I complete my shaping, now I'm going to do my cleaning. So spend 50 minutes, put your sodium hypochlorite inside the root canal and leave it there for uh, 90, minutes, 90 seconds, and then continue with 60 seconds activations. And then again, we need to continue with the sodium hypochlorite for another uh, one minute and a half, and continue with activations for 60 seconds. Refresh a new one with your new fresh sodium hypochlorite for uh, 1 minute th uh, 30 seconds and activate again for 60 seconds. Repeat this, this until 5 cycles and then finally after you finish the 5 cycles of sodium hypochlorite, you can edit it with EDTA for 1 minute and 30 seconds and then again you need to activate it for another 60 seconds. So if you continue this protocol, you will spend 50 minutes for the complete uh, final cleaning of your root canal systems prior to your obturations protocol. So, uh, up to this, before I continue uh, with my topic of obturating or sealing our root canal systems, uh, I don't know how we should we go or should we take some questions? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the first session of the presentation. It's really wonderful. Uh, I believe nowadays many dentists, many the participation uh, understand more about the different access uh, determination and also how the difference between traditional uh, access and uh, cons uh, conservative one. And also for yes. irrigation, because instruments roughly maximum can touch only 70% to 85%, so they are still remain 15 to 30% untouched by instruments. So irrigation is really necessary, and we also understand the combination about uh, sodium hypochlorite and the EDTA, how's the, how it works for remove biofilm and all the uh, inactive the bacteria. It's really wonderful. So now, uh, due to the uh, uh, some show period of the uh, the accident so we would like to uh, skip uh, the break time to uh, the okay. Q&A session so now probably we got few questions we would like to ask Dr. Marino to uh, answer for the participation and then we can keep going for the sealing our root canal system session thank you very okay, much Holly. wonderful So, uh, can everybody read the question one? Like, uh, the first one, why sometimes when I do RCT, root canal treatment, I can negotiate the canal to the working lens with K-file, 
but once I switch to rotary Nikon titanium bio, it cannot reach the working lens, although I use the smaller size and taper bio. What did I do wrong? This is the first question. Okay, uh, very interesting questions. Uh, I need to understand actually, is it uh, uh, the case that uh, the questions has been dealing with, is it a vital case or it is a necrotic case? But I'm going to answer you both. Usually in vital cases, we know there is a pop tissue inside our root canal. And usually when we use insertions, uh, when, when initial insertions of the root canal that contains vital pop using our K file, we need to be very careful with that and we need to make sure we use lubricants inside it. Because what happens if we pierce the pulp with our K file, usually the pulp will collapse. And when it's collapsed and you keep pushing it apically, it will stuck at the apical. So you think with the K file you will reach the working length, yes. But when you remove the file, instantly the pulp will collapse. And when it's collapsed, and then now you try to insert it with your rotary instrumentations, then you will find it is, uh, there is some blockage. So therefore, mm -hmm. usually it is, some, it is like a classic conditions uh, when people asking these questions, because usually it is a vital case, and they push uh, the K file into the working length, and then suddenly when they take it out and the pulp is collapsing, and then they will difficult to have to regain uh, the the uh, the working length with the nitile files. What about the necrotic tissue? It is almost the same story. That's why uh, nowadays with the advance of the nitile instrumentations, I'm going to say in my hand, in my personal opinion, I would say that the rotary instrumentations is safer and is more predictable comparing the, the manual night eye. So as you can maybe see my image previously, I'm going to, uh, I only mentioned scout your canals using number 10 K files, but I never hardly scout my canals up to working length. So I usually insert my 10 K files. I still remember what uh, Dr. Grande has uh, uh, sharing all with us about the 10 K files rules. So it means if you put your K files number 10 and it goes into the working length easily, it means you don't have any, any problems with that. But if you put your K files and in, in the middle of nowhere, you, you, you have a feeling that you need to a little bit add more pressure, it means don't do it. It means just immediately take it out the K file because it is not safe to use K file in that case. It means I directly jump into my rotary instrumentations, in this case, my rotary glide path. So that's my personal opinion. And it's safer in that way, uh, uh, comparing if we just try to push my, uh, our manual filing into the leg. Okay, so probably uh, uh, Dr. Marino had already answered uh, his opinion for the question one. Uh, another uh, second one, uh, I think it's uh, another quick question from, uh, uh, there's uh, another question. Well, Dr. Marino, you use uh, hypo uh, sodium hypochloride after EDTA again, or after EDTA, you will go through to uh, use saline to clean all the solution, then you will do obturation? Yes, so I'm, I'm going to use my uh, uh, sodium hypochlorite, then follow it with the EDTA, as you see on the protocols that has been, I've been sharing previously. So it means uh, after EDTA, you will go through directly to saline and you won't do uh, okay. sodium hypochlorite again? Yes, correct. Okay. So maybe uh, due to the time limit, maybe we will yes. pick up one more question. So everybody can still send your question to Q&A link that I will give you link as the comment, uh, in the comment. Uh, so you can still list up your question and we will feedback you after webinar as well. So uh, 
the last question should be uh, okay. How can we prevent irrigation extrusion from the apical foramen if we have to insert the needle closer to the apex? Okay, good questions. First thing first, do not uh, sh uh, do not over instrument your canal. So it means maintain your working length nicely. Uh, don't try go further beyond the working length, and try uh, not to uh, make it bigger because the, the the bigger the files, it means the wider the apical foramen, and the less top the apical area has uh, has 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 uh, the resistance form. So uh, try to see if you have uh, if you are dealing with the wide apex. So it means you need to put your irrigation needle about three to four millimeter before the working length. I mean short from the working length. But if you have a normal canal, you can go a little bit further. Also uh, apply the pressure and uh, and and try not to push as hard as you can, especially when you are dealing with the maxillary motor. And also uh, try to have a taper instrumentations to create a good resistance form. Okay, so uh, probably uh, we are really, uh, we do apologize because the time limited, we cannot answer all the questions immediately at this moment. And some of the questions might relate to some clinical protocol or tips. And actually, I would like to give a quick uh, information. Actually, uh, Dr. Marino has his, his own uh, then uh, advanced or premium then uh, endodontic training center in uh, in Indonesia. So if you are interested, actually you can keep following his fan page or you can request the uh, uh, private contact uh, email from him, then uh, you might get more advanced information from him as well. So now we might keep going through the next topic, which is sealing our root canal systems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Howie. So Leisure. after we after we complete our root canal preparations, it means after we complete our shaping and cleaning, now it's time to seal our root canal systems. I always say that root canal, uh, root canal systems, uh, if you are talking about the obturations, obturations actually is just a reflection of our shaping and cleaning of our, our preparations protocol. Because uh, good prepared root canal definitely will make a good obturations. So if you don't have good obturations, always ask yourself, have I done good preparations of my root canal? Because if it is not, so it means that is the answer. Because what you can see from this image that I have from Dr. Francisco Balandrano, you can see here the apical, it looks like okay. If you took an x-ray, the, the feeling was like okay. But there is a lot of uh, necrotic tissue over there, and also there is uh, lateral canals over there that has been not been cleaned properly. So it means that no matter how good uh, you are doing obturations, it is impossible if you are not doing any good preparations. You can see here, this is all clean, uh, uh, this is all unclean canal. There is still some necrotic tissue in all the accessories. You can see there is more ramifications here, and there is also an apical delta, and the cementations stop over here. It cannot keep go long because there is some debris that has not been cleaned yet. So therefore, we need to understand about uh, obturations if we want to think about uh, three-dimensional obturations. First thing first, do good preparations, then you will have good obturations. But in order to have good obturations, in order also to indicate it about the systems of our root canal, we need to think about three-dimensional obturations. Because what Shielders also said in 1967, over the years, the adequacy of our root canal, root canal filling usually is based on our vertical appearance on the X-ray. We start, we took an X-ray, we see, oh, the vertical extent was nice, it's reaching the apex. But Unfortunately, not uh, all the X-ray findings are 100% correct because uh, we can see we can see because if what Childers also said that in every practice we need to emphasize not on the vertical appearance of the X-ray, 
but we need to emphasizing eliminating of the root canal system as the entirely systems. Because if we think about it, it means we need uh, to do our good preparations and then we can do our obturations protocol with an, with, with, uh, to achieve three-dimensional obturations. Therefore, there is also a very, very nice uh, title of this paper that I really like to read it because it is actually true uh, from uh, Rafael Michels from Belgium. And what he said, do actually our obturations x-ray is a white line or a white line? Because usually we can see only a lines, but we don't know whether is it really, really three-dimensional. Because what we know, three-dimensional is just a terms. A terms to reflect that we, are, we already think about root canal as a systems. Because no one, no one can, uh, can confirm is it really, really three-dimensional obturations just by, uh, just by looking from an X-ray. Therefore, what Schilder said that the final objective of our endodontic procedures is the total obturations of this root canal space. It means that the biologic necessity of eliminations of, or, uh, of the protein uh, products of the bacteria or the toxins from the tissue necrotic or everything from inside the root canals. Because what we remove from the root canal, it is more important than what we place inside according to Schilder's. Therefore, if we are talking about the sealing our, our root canal, we know that we are dealing with the variations of space. Not all root canal is just a canal. Mostly they have some complexity. So therefore, we need to provide the removal of all the debris and bacteria and tissue, give a good access to the foramen, and we need to offer a, a ship or a resistance uh, ship that can uh, uh, take uh, placements of dense filling material inside our root canal systems. Therefore, the ideal root canal filling material should be inert, homogeneous, it is stable, and it's, uh, it must be biocompatible. And last but not least, it must be many, can be manipulated with good plasticity. Because if it is not plastic enough, it is impossible to seal all the canals. So the main ingredients that we use up to date is the gutta percha. Gutta percha, I, 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 until now, is still widely used. It is a semi-solid filling materials. It is not resorbable. It is biocompatibility as well. And it is, uh, can be easily sterilized, uh, sterilized. And it has a very good opacity. Well, actually, if you can see, this is the compositions of the gutta percha. It has some zinc oxide as a filler. It has a metal sulfate as a radiopacity. And actually, gutta percha also shows some bacterial evidence according to the journal that was uh, written in triple OPEC in 1982 at that time. But the problem of the gutta percha, if you want to use it, sometimes it is too loose or is it too tight. Therefore, before our obturations, after we are completed our shaping and tuning protocols, I am suggesting that we definitely need to do our gauging apically to make sure the apical fit our, our, of our uh, obturations. Because as we understand that mostly our canal is not round, mostly our canal is oval. So we need to understand the apical fit of the gutta percha that we use for our obturations. How can we do our gauging? We can use first of all visual gauging, and then we can use our night flex. And then lastly, we need to use also a gutta percha gauging. And usually I also suggest to all of you, we do gauging, not just choose one from these three. No, we do all three uh, technique to gauge and to make sure that we don't have any overfill. How if you want to use visual? For example, if I'm using my 2506 M2, this is my 2506 insert into the canal and take it out. You can see, you, we barely see the debris in the apical area. We only see the apical area in this side. So it means the apical area was larger than the number 25. So it means we need to think and be careful. If you want to fill using the gutta percha of 2506, you might end it up with over extensions your gutta percha because it doesn't cut at all at the apical area. It means the apical area, it might be wider than the instruments that we use. Secondly, we can use our Niaflex. Why you don't use K-file? For example, you can see here the differentiations. K-file is stiff, Niaflex is more flexible. 
if you put your K file into this type of canal, it means there is some curvature, and you feel you feel there is some sensations of a, a good apical stop, or maybe you feel some sensations of good tuckback. But otherwise, the tuckback was not happen in the apical area. It happens on the curvature area because it's stiff. Therefore, I am suggesting you to use your night tie flex instead of the K file. Because if you use night tie flex, since it's flexible, we can rest assured that the flexibility is not uh, depending uh, from the curvature. So if you use night tie flex and there is sensations of good AP cross stop that you feel, we might have a, a good uh, uh, apical stop or apical fit at the apical area. It is also been thought by Cliff Rudder, uh when he uh, invented Pro Taper at the time. He suggested after we finish, you check visually. If you see that the visual is good, it means the debris is touching all over the apical area. It means after you finish with the F1, as the apical is 20, you take uh, night eye flex number 20 and check whether is it fit or is it loose. If it is loose, it means you need to go one size bigger with night eye flex 25 and you make sure it is fit. Because sometimes if you are trying to rotate your instrumentations in curvature area, it's different when you rotate it in the straight air canal. In the straight canal, the rotations is constantly rotating. But if you try to bend it, your rotary, and in the curve canal, and you try to rotate, the tip of the, rot uh, of the instrument will not rotate in a direct, uh, in a simultaneously directions. It will rotate like a, a flaring uh, flame. So therefore, we need to check, uh, uh, double check, and maybe triple check with our gutta percha as our last gouging technique. And what we can do, uh, you can use a gutta percha gouge in this case to gouge, to gauge your gutta percha. For example, if you finish, let's say, uh, with M22506, I suggest you don't take 2506 gutta percha if you want to do with warm vertical obturations technique. If you want to use single cone, it's another story. But if you are talking about three-dimensional obturations to filling all the spaces, it means single cone is not advisable for this kind of uh, te obturations technique. But if you want to use warm vertical condensation in this in this case, we need to plasticize our cardioporcha and we want to condense and make it packed as a homogeneous material. Definitely, I suggest you to take a taper four of cardioporcha. Because sometimes if you use taper six with the same taper, the fit was not on the apical area, but in the body of the cardioporcha. So once I take uh, my gutta percha 4% taper, I take 925, I put it on my working length and I check. If I don't have good enough apical stop with my 25504 taper of gutta percha inside my 2506 instrumentation, then I'm going to resize my gutta percha into one size larger. In this case, it's number 30. So what you need to do is insert your 2504 uh, taper gutta percha into this number 30 slot and you will see there is some uh, over uh, extensions at the back and you directly you immediately take your uh, new scalpel and cut it and, ex and uh, immediately instantly your tip of your gutta percha at this time is definitely number 30. But make sure you have a good cutter or good uh, sharp uh, scalpel to cut because otherwise you will have a fling like this and you will create a leakage in your apical area and not, not have a good apical stop and a good ceiling. Because what we want is this uh, conditions and not in this conditions. So therefore, if you want to use a warm vertical condensation technique, always find a gutta percha with this one smaller taper compared to your taper of your instrumentation size. Because we want to achieve a good apical stop in this case, so it means you need to push, uh, you need to make sure you have a good apical stop by doing some gauging. And what I can give you some tips about using gutta percha is gauging. Make sure you always fill your canal with some fluid because fluid will imitate our sealer and uh, it can affect the smoothness insertion of the gutta percha. 
because sometimes the difference is if you don't do your comb trial with some uh, fluid, then once you put a sealer, you will feel it a bit loosened and it will be slippery and it will be over extensions of the gutter per chunk. So as you can see here, after root canal, I will try my uh, gauging with my knife eye flex and make sure you confirm with your apex locator. Do not push, just slowly. Sometimes I only tap my knife eye flex in order to reach the working length. And once the confirmations of the working length is okay, make sure you, uh, you uh, check your rubber stop and uh, don't forget to full fit uh, your canal. And now try to use your cutter percha as your cone gauging. Okay. And if I use this gutter percha and it fit, so it means I have a good tuck back and it means this is my master cone that I can use for my warm vertical condensation technique. So once again, in order to achieve what we know as three-dimensional obturations, what Shielder said that we need something that can be plasticized because if we can plasticize, it means we can pack our gutter percha. So how can we plasticize gutter percha? Of course, by applying some heat. If we apply some heat, it means by doing some warm vertical condensation, we apply some heat, it means we can transform the uh, softened gutter percha and remove the amount, uh, maximum amount of the heat softened gutter percha apically. And at that time, it will creating hydraulic effects to fulfill all the present space inside the system with the maximum amount of the gutter percha and the minimum amount of sealer. Because once we can plasticide by heat it, we can pack the gutter percha and we pack it vertically. And at the same time, it will create lateral force to press all the sealer uh, and fill all the canal space and all the uh, accessories inside the canal. And in order to have a good uh, result, of warm vertical condensations, we need three conditions. We need just the right size of gutter percha, like I said before. We need the, just the right heat plugger of the depth of the heat plugger, and we need just the right amount of sealer. Cone fitting is crucial. Is crucial. Usually, I always find a fit that is cone about 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter uh, short from the working length, as you can see here, I'm putting a short a little bit because once we apply pressure, there is a, a hydraulic pressures that can uh, happen inside the canal that can push uh, the cone further 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter up into our working length. I will give you the, the video uh, right after this moment. And also we need just the right heat plugger, or I mean the depth. We need to understand where, when we want to insert our heat plugger, we need to find the plugger in which the metal does not touch the wall. For example, we need to find the plugger like this in this condition. It is not touching the wall. Because if it is touching the wall, it means, number one, we will not able to plasticize the amount, the enough amount of the gutter percha, and definitely we can create increasing temperature of the root surface increasingly rapidly, and it will also endanger the bone and the surrounding periapical tissue. So by finding the correct heat plugger, we need to find the correct heat plugger that, we, that is not touching the wall, and it simply sinks into the heat softened cut aperture, and it is not any, it is not fresh at all for the gutta percha. As you can see here, there is this is the image from the Castellucci, and you can see the, he also find always find this uh, the gutta percha that fit uh, 0 0.521 millimeter of the gutta of, of, of the length. And the plugger also must be captured the maximum width of the gutta percha so it can be pushed uh, vertically all of the volume of the gutta percha into the apical area. So pre-fitting is important before we need uh, to do my obturations. Find the plugger that, cannot that is not touching the wall and it's completely uh, in contact with the gutter percha. So it means that it's the first plugger that I'm going to put inside my uh, root canal wall. 
And third things that is also important if you want to uh, do a warm particle condensation is to just the right amount of sealer. Don't use too many sealer. Usually I just put my cutter percha and dip into a sealer and uh, insert it into the canal directly. Or you can use paper point. Sometimes paper point also beneficial because it can absorb uh, the excess sealer that can happen in the inside of the root canal. And a good sealer that we use, it must have a good antibacterial property and it has a property also for lubricating our gutta percha and has a good radiopacity for also uh, as a marker to fill all the isthmuses, all the accessories and all the lateral canals. And the requirement is definitely, it must be easy to manipulate, it must be biocompatible, it must be radiopaque enough and it's definitely easy to manipulate it. So, Usually, I just put my sealer like this into the uh, into the canal, and not use too many sealer. And once it's set, so it means you can continue to cut and you can continue to condense uh, your uh, obturations in uh, the next process. So what I can give you is the warm particle condensation. So warm particle condensation uses two tips. And first thing, you use the heat plugger to cut the excess of the gutta percha from the coronal to a uh, point of view. After cutting it, there will be some plasticide gutta percha below four millimeter from the heating point. And then you just use your plugger that has been used, pre that has been measured previously, and then you condense it directly and transfer it into uh, the depth that you desire that you want it. And once again, use the plugger to condense it and once you condense vertically, there is a pressure and the sealer automatically will fill all the, all the spaces that is necessary to be filled. And then continue again to remove the remaining part of the curta percha until you, re you reach five to seven millimeters from the apical. That's what a warm particle condensation technique is all about. After we condense it, try to, to wait until the curta percha is cool and level and then after that, we will, we will continue the backfilling. I'm going to show you what we know about the cork phenomenon. As you can see, my gutta percha was stopped, let's say, one millimeter from the working length. So I cut now the excess here using my heat plugger. Now I'm going to uh, condense and I'm going to do my warm particle condensation technique. You still see there is no anything like that. But once you pack with, with heat, and they apply vertical condensations, you can see directly, this is what we call a cork phenomenon, all the gutta percha and the sealer goes right into the desired length. This is important because if you are looking the gutta percha that it is close or is at the working length, and when you apply heat and you condense vertically, you might end, up, end it up with overfilling or over extensions of your gutta percha. So that's why uh, we need to understand the, uh, the right uh, size of your gutta percha with the depth, uh, right depth of our heat blocker. And after we failed to uh, do some down packing, and now it's time for us to back filling. We can use the other side of the equipment. Is it the extruder in which it will uh, extrude all the heated gutta percha? You can do it incrementally. Uh, I suggest you to do it increments. So step by step, condense it to avoid uh, any uh, void spaces. So once you can condense, you can gain back up a uh, little bit, increment up. And once again, you condense it with your plugger. Once the plugger is condensed and the gutta percha is cool, then you can continue again with the other back filling up into the level of the orifice level. You need to also make sure that your or, uh, your gutta percha is not go expand beyond the orifice level since it might interfere with your restoration protocol. So after it's uh, it's shaped, it is clean, it's gauge already. Now I'm going to. Uh, do my obturations. I'm going to repeat again with my gauging and confirmations with the working length once again with apex locator to make sure that I'm not go further beyond the uh, 
constrictions and beyond is necessary. Adjust the rubber stop to the desired level that we need. Again, can, can fill your root canal uh, with your uh, fluid to mimic a root canal sealer when you want to try your uh, gutta percha as an apical gauging uh, technique with cone. And once you think it is okay, once you think it is the right size of gutta percha, don't forget to activate again your uh, irrigants as your final uh, irrigations. Make sure to flush everything out. Don't forget to dry the canal. Make sure it's dry. And you put sealer, as you can see, I only use a, a little bit amount of sealer with my gutta percha. And you insert gutta percha. I try to find a bit, as you can see, see one millimeter from the length. As you can see, this is my uh, working length position. So I try to find my gutta percha, which is uh, 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter shorter from the working length since I'm going to do my warm particle condensation technique. And I am reducing my risk of having my overextension or overfilling of my filling material outside the canal space. And you do the down pack. You can see now I'm going to put my plugger and pack it nicely until you feel that the gutta percha has been cold and it's uh, transfer back into the solid state as before is the pesticide state of gutta percha. And then you can continue until you reach the desired length of your vertical, warm vertical condensations and you can continue then with your back filling uh, at the apical part, at, at the coronal part of the uh, canal. So this is the final obturations of the x-ray. And now I'm going just to do a little bit short brief about the open apex since this is a different case scenario uh, if you are dealing, comparing with the regular root canal because this is definitely, it is not a case that you can obturate with, with a regular uh, obturations technique because one thing first, the challenge is not just obturations but we cannot clean and use disinfections as the same protocol like a normal canal because it has no apical stop whatsoever. Uh, so it means the obturations options is only you cannot do any conventional. Either you can do apexifications, you can do your apical barrier technique using some MTA, or you can do your regenerations protocols. In which regenerations protocols uh, is a technique that recently has been conducted and researched uh, widely and has been uh, clinically proven, evidently also okay and promising. And it's a treatment to pr uh, procedure that is designed to replace uh, a damaged pulp tissue with the viable tissue and restore the normal functions of the pulp. And usually the advantages of these uh, procedures is that we still can have uh, the possibility of uh, gate, uh, gaining uh, more apical growth into our cases and we can reinforce uh, our dentinal wall by increasing thickness of the dentinal wall. So what is the protocol if I want to do with uh, these regenerations in uh, open apex cases. First of all, I'm going definitely to use my disinfection since I'm not sure we need some instrumentation since usually the canal has been widely big uh, sizes and we still need some antibiotic based for medications. And if you need to use MTA, definitely we need to induce some bleeding. And, why, uh, and when the MTA is contact with the bleeding and definitely that's the magic happen uh, that's when the uh, regenerations will take effect uh, because the calcium uh, silicate that is, has, has been uh, there as a uh, MTA properties, it can contact uh, with the tissue and it will create some hydroxy appetite as the, uh, as the uh, start of the uh, heart tissue component. So what we need is actually is a MAP carrier, micro apical uh, placement systems, uh, MAP systems, we need also a plugger. And sometimes I also need my uh, collagen fibrin. If the apical was too big, 
then I'm going to need uh, my Fibonacci at, at the apical stop and make sure my MTA doesn't go past further beyond the apical area that I need to make it stop. So as you can see, this is the wide apex. You can see this is the very apical region. Try to induce a little bit of bleeding point. And if you try to uh, induce that, I'm, now I'm going to put my MTA at the level of the apical area. Uh, use the combinations with your uh, micro brush to condense the MTA at the apical area and put the MTA uh, once again also step by step, increments by increments until the desired level that we need to, uh, we want to achieve. Use the combinations also with your micro brush as well, just to make sure to push the MTA and to ex uh, absorb excess moisture from the MTA, because if you have too much uh, moist, also the MTA will not set properly. You need to have just a right uh, moisture from the MTA in order to have uh, a good setting of the MTA. Once the MTA is reaching the level that I want it, so stop. In this case, I put a, a space between my MTA and my temporary filling, and this is the post up after my composite bonded restorations. And you can see that two years after, this is the follow up of two years, uh, you can see that the apical area now is growing back from 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 uh, two years after, and this tooth has, has uh, been orthodontically treated and has no uh, problem with whatsoever. And you can see now the apical area is growing. Uh, CBCT has confirmed it. So what is the criteria of success of this regeneration protocol? Usually, uh, uh, researchers indicate the four uh, criteria, criteria for success. First, it definitely we have eliminations of symptoms. Second, we have evidence of bone healing. It means the lesion is healing. Number three, we have uh, evidence of increasing of root wall thickness and also length. And fourth, sometimes we will have a positive response back again with the electronic pop tester. So we don't need to achieve all those four, but at least by achieving more than one science of success, we can say that the success is there. As you can see here, this is the pre-op. This is a widely open apex with a thin, uh, thin, thin thickness in this uh, area. After two years, you can see the complete uh, full growth of the apical and the thickness dentin is increasing in size. This is also another case of uh, open apex that I've been treated with regenerations in the dentic process. But with this case, it's quite different. I want to make a different uh, approach or different strategy and tactics with this uh, case. After I creating blood, I will put my MTA and I com com combine with gutta percha. And why I'm using my gutta percha, I am planning if there is uh, some problems in which the apical is not growing or maybe the, the dentin is not thickening, I can replace my gutta percha and I can put my fiber post to just reinforce the tooth uh, to have a better resistance forms in the future. So once again, I create my bleeding point over there. As you can see, there is the bleeding point. So now I'm trying to put my MTA inside. In this case, I'm using my collagen free print, so I don't want my MTA to just uh, extrude all over the place outside the apical uh, area that I want the, uh, the MTA to stop. So I put my free print, as you can see, the free print now has been quite wet because it's in contact with the uh, blood. Because once again, we need moisture. If it is too dry, uh, the, uh, the apical area is too dry, then your MTA will not work and the regenerations will not take process. So use your map system to put your MTA, as I mentioned you before, incrementally. Use your plugger to condense the MTA in combinations with your micro brush. Again, uh, you use it step by step. You can see now there is another amount of MTA, and then I need to pack it with my plugger, and I need to pack it again in combinations with my uh, micro brush.
Okay, you can put add, you can add more up into the level that you want. Make sure you you condense it because since the the wide open apex usually the canal is irregular, so we need to make sure we need to condense it so it can fill the shapes of the canal. And finally, if you reaching the desire, usually I put my micro brush just to make sure. I can condense and I can clean my excess of MTA in the in the root canal wall, and I can make my MTA a little bit moist as it needed uh, for the MTA uh, to set. So once uh, it's it's like that, it depends on your MTA. If your MTA is is a fast setting, about 15 minutes, uh, you can wait and then you can continue to fill up to rate it with the uh, with the cara percha. But usually the open apex cases is happen in the young dentition, so usually the patient is, is less teenager. So usually I prefer to just put my temporary filling and I will see uh, him or, uh, or her in the next visit just to make sure and just to continue my process of obturations. And here you can see this another uh, another uh, uh, continuations of my carapercha. And this is six months follow up. This is 12 months of follow up. And this is 18 months, as you can see now, it's getting uh, longer. And this is the pre-op, and you can see 12 months, you can see that the thickness of dentin is increasing and the apical now is closing. And this is the 18 months, you can see the, uh, you can see the evidence is uh, better. And this is the OPG from uh, post-op and six months. You can see now the lesion is healing and the width of the uh, root canal is now is smaller, so it means the wall, uh, thickness wall is increasing, and this is, this is the 18 months. You can see it's almost completely closed. And this is the CBCT from post-op. You can see there is a lesion, six months, the lesion is gone. The, AP, uh, the root canal is now, the diameter is smaller. And this is the 12 months, you can see now the wall is thickening of the root. And this is the post-op from the circuit point of view. The lesion is gone, and once again, the thickness of the dentin is evident. Now you can see actually from the CBCT in the 12 months, the apical is already closing, and this is the 18 months. So uh, this is the coronal view. When you can see this is a very big open apex and there is a lesion. Six months uh, from the coronal point of view uh, sections, you can see it is closing already. And this is the 12 months, and this is the 18 months of follow-up. So. The regeneration uh, endodontic procedure actually is a procedure that I can say, if done correctly and properly, it will can give us a predictable result. Uh, but of course, we need to be very careful to uh, select our cases, and we need to make sure that our patient is understand the risk because we cannot say 100% that the growth of the apical, also the dentin thickness is 100% guaranteed. So last but not least, as I mentioned you before, after we finish it with obturations, then we need to final uh, restorations as completely to seal all the coronal sealing. Why it is important? Because if we don't provide a correct restorations in our endodontically treated tooth, it's the same like if we are selling a house without a roof. Because we know for sure the importance of coronal sealing is, is really, really important. Uh, the relevance of the, the relevance of sealing endodontically to the teeth will increase success is not is not a nonsense. It is real. You can see here uh, there is a don't do uh, closing in a correct way. Definitely there is a leakage and the bacteria will grow back, grow back and penetrate our uh, work that has been done correctly. Because coronal uh, bacteria infiltrations is one of the main cause. So we are not thinking about the bacteria that has been persist inside our root canal, but also the problem of failure also caused by the coronal bacteria uh, entrance that usually caused by bad restorations. Uh, Friedman in uh, 2004 has spoke that the teeth with apical periodontitis to completely heal after initial or retreatment is 74 to 86%. And their chance to be functional over 90 is 91 to 97 percent. And this can be completely achieved if we also applying a correct restorations. So once again, the clinical objective when we are treating the endodontically treated teeth 
as also it is in conjunction with the minimally invasive endodontic, we need to remember that we need also to restore function because the final objective of endodontic treatment is to save natural tooth and it, to make it function without any symptoms and normally without any problems. And in order to restore functions, therefore we need to preserve as much as tooth structure and stabilize uh, tooth structures. We need to prevent infections and also reinfections, and we need to rebuild aesthetic. This is also one of a kind uh, evidence or journal that has been uh, uh, taught many, many times in, in the International Endodontic Journal by Martin Troop, that combinations of good endo and good resto, of course, it will achieve 92% of success. Even though you do good endo, if you don't bad restorative, of course, the percentage was not high. So therefore, Restoration is so important in the longevity of our endodontic tooth. FIDE in 1991 has classified the failure of endodontic teeth, and it's not surprising that more than 50% cause of failure is not because of the endodontic failure. It is caused because of the prosthetic failure. It means it is the restorative function. Because we need to understand if we, if we do some endodontic uh, treatment into some specific teeth and we want to restore it, we need to understand because the, each tooth is different. For example, the occlusal force from this side to this side, it is higher, goes to lower. But the shear stress force from this side to that side, it is increasing. And this is different because each tooth has a different function. Therefore, we need to pay attention of the restorations as well. Can you see this? The endo is not that bad, but you can see there is a huge gap between the post and the uh, obturation material. There is a leakage of the core. The margin of the crown is not so good. There is a leakage definitely that is coming from this distal area. Therefore, you will see a lesion and failing endodontic treatment. How about this? The margin is so bad. Even this, the crown was so bad placed in margin. So once again, if you don't do good restorations, this might this kind of scenario will happen. We need to not just preserve, we need to stabilize it. We just don't make a tooth that has been uh, uh, critically damaged to be more doomed and need to extract it. So therefore, we need to understand that endodontic and restorations always have a good combinations and they must work together. For example, if this case, you see the crown actually is not that bad. The margin is quite yeah, acceptable, but you see there is a lesion here. But once you open the crown, you definitely see the problem is, is there. We need to do some endodontic treatment and finish it with a good restoration. Check the margin point. If it is good, you make sure it is okay and we do some follow up. And you can see here, after two years, the thickness of the bone is increasing and getting back to normal. Also this, it, not, it doesn't have to be all indirect. As, as we know, not all cases need some uh, indirect. We can also finish it with direct. So it depends on the case and it depends on the healthy tooth structure. In this case, I don't need my indirect since the healthy tooth structure is pretty intact. So after I complete my endodontic treatment, this is a C-shape in which one can, a canal to the other canal, it has merged. So as you can see, when I put my weakens here, it will come out from that side. So you know, this is a, a merged canal. This is a confluent canal. So make sure you need to activate your irrigations. In this case, I'm going to use my ultrasonic since it has a lot of isthmuses. And usually I'm going to use my ultrasonic in this case because I believe Isthmus is a very difficult and a very challenging uh, area to clean. Therefore, I need something that definitely uh, have a better, free, uh, better vibrations in cleaning my uh, and, and activate my irrigations protocol. So after cleaning, then I go and continue my obturations. As you can see, it's a confluent canal. So you need to fill one the other side and you need to combine with the other technique. I put my warm particle condensation. As you can see, my sealer is coming out from there. So this is a merged canal. So this canal now I'm going to inject with the thermoplastized gutta percha. In this case, I'm going to use my defill extruder just to fill the remaining canals of this uh, uh, root canal systems. And once you inject it, uh, you don't forget you need to condense it. 
until it's stabilized and it's cooled and uh, you continue with your restorations. As you can see here, there is a, a confluent, there's two canals that they are joining into one. You can see there is a little bit of ramifications on the apical area. And this is the post-op, and you can see this is the two years after the ramification sealer is still there and the lesion is gone. The tooth was function as normal, and we can maintain quite good structures both in the PCD area and also in the coronal area of the tooth. So I think we are uh, close to three hours. I think now it's more uh, two minutes more to three hours. So I think I'm not going to uh, spend your time more. Uh, so once again, thank you very much to stick with me for this whole three hours. I hope there is something that I can give you from my sharing uh, from my webinar uh, today. And there is something that you can apply into your clinical routine for endodontic treatment. So once again, thank you. And I'm really sorry for there is uh, for uh, if there is some inconvenience that we have.